Hello everyone, I'm Kiki Goyal from IIT Bombay and today I'll be talking about Hilbert Cohn's function of the Riesz algebra. So this talk will be broadly divided into two parts. The first part will be a literature survey where uh, starting with the definitions, uh, we'll look at some results which uh, characterize certain properties of rings using Hilbert Cohn's multiplicity. Then we'll compare certain properties of uh, Hilbert Cohn's multiplicity with the famous Hilbert Samuel multiplicity. Uh, next, we look at uh, a few cases in which in this number is known to be a rational number and uh, of course some cases and rather some conjectures in which the Hilbert Cohn's multiplicity is uh, known to be an irrational number. Then we'll uh, proceed towards looking at the Hilbert Cohn's multiplicity of the Riesz algebra which will lead us to the second part of the talk which is uh, my recent research work. Broadly two projects, uh, the first one with uh, Mitra Kohli and Professor Verma and the second one with Arindam Manaji and Professor Verma. We'll begin with some results in dimension one case. Uh, for high dimensions, we look at the generalized Hilbert Cohn's function. And as a particular case, or as a particular example, uh, we look at the case of uh, standardized measures. So let's proceed. Uh, we'll fix a few notations and definitions. So throughout the talk, the ring R will be a Noberian local ring with prime characteristic P. M will be its unique maximum homogeneous cycle. Q will always be a prime power. Then for an R ideal I, the eighth continuous power of I, which we denote by I square bracket Q, where Q is P to the E, is the ideal generated by the Qth power of the elements of the ideal I. Then if M is a finitely generated R module and we have an M prime the ideal I, then the length function, which is length of M over I square bracket P to the E times the module M, is called the Hilbert Cohn's function of the module M with respect to the ID I. Let's quickly look at a few examples. So the first one is the case when I is generated by a regular sequence, say x1 up to xp, where d is the dimension of the ring. And we want to compute the Hilbert Cohn's function of R with respect to I. So in order to calculate length of R over I square bracket Q, this means we need to calculate length of R over the I is generated by the Qth power of the elements x1, so on, up to xp. But now since these elements form a regular sequence, uh, this will imply that the ideal generated by x1 to the q, so on xp to the q, will also be an ideal generated by a regular sequence. And hence, this length will turn out to be q to the d times length of r over i. Next example is in the case of regular local rings, where if we have an imprimary ideal i and r is a regular local ring, then length of r over i square bracket q is equal to q to the d times length of r over i and this is true for all q. Uh, this requires one quick but very important fact that in the case of regular local rings, the Frobenius map is actually a flat ring. So this Hilbert Cohn's function was actually started by Ernst Kunz in 1969 and he used this function to characterize regular local rings and the result he proved is the following. So let's suppose d is the dimension of the ring r then he proved that for all q, the Hilbert Cohn's function of r with respect to its maximum homogeneous ideal, which is length of r over m square bracket q, is always bigger than equal to q to the power d. And uh, moreover, he proved that equality in this case holds for a particular q, and in general for every q, if and only if the ring r is a regular local ring. So one side of this uh, equality is easy to see. If r is a regular local ring, then length of r over m square bracket q is actually q to the d, and this holds true for all q. This follows from the example we just saw uh, in the previous slide where r is a regular local ring. If we put i equal to m, then since length of r over m is equal to 1, we get the required answer for all q. Uh, so this function was actually uh, explored further by Kunz in uh, 1976 paper of his, where he explored the behavior of this function under localization, base change, and a few more things. So one quick result which I would like to quote here uh, is the following. And if you are familiar with Lex inequality in the case of Hilbert Samuel multiplicities, uh, it's easy to see a parallel between these two results. Uh, of course, uh, the Lex inequality, uh, the kind of result I want to state here for Hilbert Cohn's multiplicity is still a conjecture for Hilbert Samuel multiplicity. So what Kuhn's proof is the following. So let's say we have a map P from rings Rm to Sn. It's a flat local homomorphism of Noetherian local rings with prime characteristic P. 
then he proved that for all e the hilbert kunz function of r with respect to its maximal homogeneous setting over through to the dimension of the ring is always less than equal to the hilbert kunz function of s with respect to its maximal homogeneous setting over through to the dimension of s so next thing uh, that one would want to look at after looking at this function is the asymptotic limit of this function and one would want to know if this limit exists or not so of course in the same paper uh, kunz uh, looked at uh, the possibility of the existence of the asymptotic limit of this function and via an example he stated that this limit may not exist but uh, this uh, statement of uh, kunz was disproved by Mansky later in 1983 where he proved that this limit in these exist and he also pointed out the flaw in the argument of this so this is what Mansky proved so he said that there exists a real constant cm says that the hilbert kunz function of n with respect to i can be written in the following form where the leading coefficient is cm times q to the d plus whatever is left is of order q to the d minus in particular, the asymptotic limit of this function, which we denote by E sub H k of i comma m, exists, and we call it as the Hilbert Kunz multiplicity of the module m with respect to the ideal i. So let's fix a notation here. So by E sub H k of r, we mean the Hilbert Kunz multiplicity of r with respect to its maximum homogeneous ideal, and uh, whenever the ring r is known, uh, we can drop uh, the variable r from the notation. So uh, since uh, the Hilbert Kunz multiplicity is an asymptotic limit, the other asymptotic limit that we are familiar of is the Hilbert Samuel multiplicity, which is uh, limit of length of r over i to the n times t factorial over n to the d. Of course, i's and m can be identified. So given these two asymptotic limits, one would want to ask if uh, these two numbers can be compared. And this is indeed true. The Hilbert Kunz multiplicity of an n prime real i, of course, in positive characteristic, is sandwiched between the Hilbert Samuel multiplicity and Hilbert Samuel multiplicity over d factorial. As an easy consequence, one can see that if the dimension of the ring is 1, then these two numbers actually coincide. But what about higher dimensions? Do we have a similar result for uh, higher dimensions? Uh, that's not true. For higher dimensions, we can have a strict inequality between these numbers. And here's a quick example. So let's say we have a field K with positive characteristic, and then we have a ring R to be the quotient of power series ring K X Y Z over the element X Y plus Z to the n plus one, where n is at least one. In this case, it is known that the Hilbert Kunz multiplicity is two minus one over n plus one. So two observations here. Firstly, uh, it's not equal to the multiplicity because multiplicity over here is two. Uh, multiplicity of the ring over here is two. And uh, secondly, the Hilbert Kunz multiplicity of the ring over here is a rational number, whereas uh, the Hilbert Samuel multiplicity is always known to be an integer. So we'll come back to this property of these two numbers later. Uh, firstly, we'll move to certain results which help in characterization of rings using Hilbert Kunz multiplicity. So quickly a definition. So let R hat denote the emadic completion of R. Then the ring R is said to be unmixed if it satisfies the following property that the dimension of R hat mod P should be equal to the dimension of the ring, and this should hold true for all minimal prime ideals P of R hat. So we have a characterization of regular local rings by Nagata, where he proved that in case of unmixed rings, the ring is regular local if and only if its Hilbert Samuel multiplicity is equal to 1. A parallel result for Hilbert Kunz multiplicity was given by Watanabe and Yoshida in 2000. They proved that an unmixed local ring is regular if and only if the Hilbert Kunz multiplicity is equal to 1. Next uh, result, which is also a parallel from the Hilbert Samuel multiplicity, is by Hoxton Hunicki. So, in the uh, case of Hilbert Samuel multiplicities, we have in arbitrary characteristic a notion of integral closure of ideals, and there is a result. Uh, which is famously called as the Rhesus multiplicity theorem, which connects the Hilbert Samuel multiplicity with uh, Hilbert Samuel multiplicity of two ideals being equal with their with the integral closures of the ideals being equal, of course, in unmixed rings. So a parallel result 
uh, was proved by Hofstra Hennigy in Characteristic P. And in Characteristic P, they looked at what is called as the site closure of I groups. So I'll quickly define what it is. So let RO denote the complement of union of all minimal primes of R. Then for an R ideal I, the site closure of I, which we denote by I star, is an ID which consists of all those elements X in the ring that satisfy the following property that there exists a C in RO such that C times X to the Q is an I square bracket Q and this should hold for all large Q. With this definition in mind, we look at the result by Hoxha Huniki in 1987 and they proved the following. So let's say we have two M primary ideals I contain MJ such that their tight closures are equal. Then they prove that in this case, these two ideals also have the same Hilbert Kunz multiplicity. So what about the converse? They proved that if the ring is analytically unramified, excellent and unmixed local ring, then the converse also holds. So over here, analytically unramified means that the magic completion is reduced. Okay, so let's come back to comparing the properties of hilbert samuel multiplicity and hilbert Kunz multiplicity. First one is the associativity formula, which holds true for both these numbers. So this formula actually relates the hilbert Kunz multiplicity or the hilbert samuel multiplicity of the module M in terms of the corresponding hilbert samuel multiplicity or Kunz multiplicity in the ring R mod P times length of M localized at P, where the prime P varies uh, over all the minimal primes of the ring, which have the same dimension as the dimension of the ring. Next is the projection formula, which is also satisfied by both these numbers. Over here, the ring R is a domain. S is a module finite extension of the ring R, which is also a domain. And in this case, the Hilbert Kunz multiplicity and parallelly the Hilbert Samuel multiplicity of ideal I in the ring R is written as the corresponding number in the extension S localized at Q times the degree of the extension of the elastic field over the degree of extension of the quotient. Next, we also saw that the characterization of regular local rings can happen by both the numbers. And next is the property of these numbers being integer or not. We know that Hilbert Samuel multiplicity is an integer, but uh, just um, in a few slides back, we saw an example where the Hilbert Kunz multiplicity was actually a rational number. What is interesting to note here that it is known that it may be an irrational number as well. So, uh, I guess this motivates us to look at a few results in the literature where uh, the number, the Hilbert Kunz multiplicity, is known to be a rational number, and of course, a few results in which it is conjectured or known to be an irrational number. So, let R be a Noetherian local ring of dimension B. A finite R module M is called maximum zone Macaulay module if it has maximum depth. This means its depth should be equal to its dimension. Which, are, which further should be equal to the dimension of the ring. Next, the ring R is said to be a finite cone Macaulay type. If up to isomorphism, there are only finitely many indecomposable maximal cone Macaulay R modules. Next, we set up a notation. So let's say we have an R module M. Then for a natural number N, by M sub round bracket N, we denote the module M, which has the same additive group as M. But the scalar multiplication with R is defined as follows. So if we have an element of the ring R, R, and if we have an element M from the module M, then the way we define R times M is R to the power P to the N times M for all the elements R in the ring and M in the module. So with this setup, it was uh, Siebert in 1997 who proved the following result. So we have a cohn macaulay local ring R of prime characteristic P, dimension B. And let's say it is a finite cohn macaulay type such that R sub round bracket 1 is a finite R module. In this case, we looked at the generating function of the Hilbert Kunz function. This means we looked at the infinite sum length of R over n square bracket P to the n times P to the n where P is an indeterminate. And we proved that this generating function is actually a rational function. In particular, this implies that the Hilbert Kunz multiplicity of the ring is actually a rational number. Next result is by Konka in 1996, where he proved the following. So let's say we have a field Q, and R is the quotient of polynomial ring PX1 up till Xn by an ideal I, where I is either a monomial ideal 
or a principal binomial homogeneous ideal. N is the maximal homogeneous ideal of the ring R. Then in this case, Conka proved that for all large Q, when we look at the Hilbert Prince function of the ring R with respect to its maximal homogeneous ideal, then it is a polynomial in Q of degree D, which is equal to the dimension of the ring. It has integer coefficient, uh, coefficients if the ideal i is generated by monomials and it has a rational coefficient if uh, the ideal i is generated by a principal binomial homogeneous ideal. Uh, actually, what he proved was something more and I'll come back to it in the second part of the talk where uh, uh, these results will play an important role. So next result is by Pardew, uh, Bookwrights, Chen and Monsky. Uh, all of them looked at separate cases of uh, this particular scenario where the ring R is quotient of the polynomial ring KXYZ by an element G, which is a homogeneous polynomial of degree 3, defining a cubic row. In uh, this case, the Hilbert Kunz multiplicity of the ring R, they proved, is a rational number. Next result is by Watanabe in 2000. He proved that if we have a normal semi group ring over a field, then the Hilbert Kunz multiplicity of the ring is a rational number. The result was further generalized by Ito in 2002. He proved that if we have a semi-group ring over a field Q, so the normality of the, condi the normality condition is dropped over here. Next, he considered an ideal I, which is a monomial ideal primary for the maximal homogeneous ideal of the ring R. So we are not just concentrated on the maximal ideal, but any M primary ideal generated by monomials. In this case, he proved that the Hilbert Kunz multiplicity of the ideal I is a rational number. Uh, this paper is actually interesting in its uh, own individual aspect as well because it's just not this result which is proved in this paper, but uh, uh, the way he proves this result is by proving that the Hilbert Kunz multiplicity in this particular setup can also be realized as the volume of a convex polytope, and he actually gives a construction of such kind of polytope. So uh, that's uh, that's a very interesting part about Hilbert Kunz multiplicity, which. Uh, one can read about. So next result is by Vijay Lakshmi Triviti in 2005. She proved that if R is a two-dimensional standard graded ring and M is the maximum homogeneous ideal, then the Hilbert Kunz multiplicity of the ring is a rational number. Next result is by Miller and Swanson in 2013. They proved that if we have a, a two cross n generic matrix X and we have the ring R to be the polynomial ring Kx over the two cross two minus of this matrix X then the Hilbert Kunz multiplicity of this ring is exactly this number n over 2 plus n over n plus 1 plus 1. Uh, actually what they proved in this paper was something more. In generality they looked at n cross n generic matrices. In that case they proved that the Hilbert Kunz function is a polynomial function and in this very particular case of 2 cross n generic matrices uh, they actually explicitly calculated what the leading coefficient is. And uh, next thing is about this number uh, n over 2 plus n over n plus 1 factorial. Even this number will play an important role in the second part of the talk and it will keep coming on over there. So uh, this finishes uh, my survey of the rationality of Hilbert Kunz multiplicity. Of course, this was not an exhaustive uh, list. Uh, this is really a word of caution. Uh, these are only very few of the results which are uh, known. Uh, um, there's ample amount of research which has already been done, but uh, in the interest of uh, space and time over here, I uh, stated only few of these results. But of course, uh, there are a lot many other cases in which this number is known to be a rational number. But then uh, let's shift our uh, focus to the cases where this number is known or rather conjectured to be an irrational number. So the first one is by Monsky in 2008. He conjectured that the Hilbert Kunz multiplicity of the maximal ideal of the power series ring F2 xy z uv by the element uv plus xq plus yq plus xyz is this particular rational number 4 by 3 plus 5 over 14 square root 7. So this is still a conjecture open till date but in the paper Monsky says that he does have a lot of computational evidence to support uh, this number as the Hilbert Kunz multiplicity of this uh, ring. Next result is by Brenner in 2013, where he gave a class of rings, uh, rather three-dimensional local domains, where these rings have irrational Hilbert Kunz multiplicities. 
Okay, so this was about properties of Hilbert Fink's multiplicity. And we can already see that this is an interesting number. But what about the Hilbert Fink's function? Of course, this function uh, also has very ambiguous behavior. Uh, for example, the Hilbert Simon function we know is a polynomial function, but uh, this is not true for Hilbert Fink's function. So, some interesting results which uh, kind of support this argument. The first one is by Monsky in 1983. He proved that if we have R to be a complete Noether and local ring of dimension one with prime characteristic P, M is a finitely generated R module and we have an M prime the ideal I, then the Hilbert Fink's function of the module M with respect to I for large Q has the following form. Over here, the leading coefficient is the, of course, the Hilbert Fink's multiplicity of M with respect to I. Over here, it's an integer. And the other part, which is the constant part of this function, uh, which we denote by alpha sub i of m comma e is not really a constant but in terms of e it's an eventually periodic function this means the hilbert Fink's function is not a polynomial function but rather it has a quasi polynomial nature so this was in dimension one for dimension two there's a result by Prenner in 2007 so he considered normal two dimension standard graded domains over algebraically closed fields of prime characteristic p and we have M prime D I is homogeneous. Then in this case, he proved that when we look at the Hilbert Fink's function of R with respect to I, then it has the following form for large Q, where the leading coefficient, which is the Hilbert Fink's multiplicity, is a rational number. There is no linear term, but again, the constant part of this function is actually an eventually periodic function of E. So let's come to the main part of the talk, where we want to talk about the Hilbert Fink's multiplicity of the Riesz algebra. So let me quickly define what the Riesz algebra is. So R is a commutative Noether local ring of dimension D, and we have an ideal I. Then the Riesz algebra of I, which we denote by script Ri, is actually an n graded ring whose nth component is I to the n times P to the n. And the only known result in this direction which computes the Hilbert Fink's multiplicity of the Riesz algebra, or rather gives a bound on the Hilbert Fink's multiplicity of the Riesz algebra is by Ito and Yushida in 2003. They prove that if we have a Noetherian local ring of dimension at least one and prime characteristic P, then for any n prime D ID I, the Hilbert Fink's multiplicity of the Riesz algebra of I is bounded above by CD times the multiplicity of I, where multiplicity of I is the Hilbert Simon multiplicity, and CD is this particular rational number. And if one clearly observes, this rational number is actually the same one which appears in the result of Miller and Swanson. And you will see this number coming up again and again later as well. So this story does not end over here. They also gave a condition in which the upper bound is attained. They prove that the equality holds if and only if the Hilbert Fink's multiplicity of the ring is same as the Hilbert Samuel multiplicity of the ideal I. So there are a few examples in which uh, indeed, E sub HK of R is equal to E of I. For example, if you look at the case of Stanley Weisner rings, and uh, let's say I is equal to M, or even I is equal to the ideal generated by linear system of parameters, then one can check that the Hilbert Fink's multiplicity of the ring is same as the multiplicity of the ID. And hence, in that case, the Hilbert Fink's multiplicity of the Riesz algebra will be exactly equal to the number CD times multiplicity of I. So uh, I intentionally said this example because um, this will be used in the later part of the talk. So this is what is known up till now. And this is what motivated us to look further, look for classes of ideals and rings in which we could explicitly calculate what the Hilbert Fink's multiplicity of the Riesz algebra of the ideal is, and to be more ambitious to calculate the Hilbert Fink's function of the Riesz algebra of the ideal, and uh, if not the function, uh, even to know about the nature of that function will also be a good idea to begin with. So uh, before I start putting up the results, let's uh, look at some definitions. So let R be another in local ring, an I be an R ID. J contained in I is called the reduction of I if J times I to the N is equal to I to the N plus one for all large N. The minimum value of such N where this condition holds for all M bigger than equal to N we set it as R sub J of I. Then the minimal reduction of I is a reduction of I, which is minimal with respect to inclusion. And 
with this we define the reduction number of the ideal i which we know by r i this is the minimum over all the values r sub j of i where j varies over the minimal reduction of the ideal i next uh, by h sub i of n we denote the hilbert samuel function of the m prime the ideal i in the ring r this is length of r over i to the n uh, we know the polynomial function let's say the polynomial uh, we denoted by p sub i of x it's a rational it's a polynomial with rational coefficients it's of degree d and let's say uh, for large n and we know it for large n that the function coincides with the polynomial and in this setup we denote the postulation number of i by n of i and it is the maximum of n such that h sub i of n is not equal to p sub i of n this means uh, beyond the postulation number the Hilbert the Hilbert Samuel function and polynomial coincide with each other. So let's look at the dimension one case. So uh, this part of work is joint work with Mr. Kohli and Professor Jogal Verma. So we began step by step with dimension one case. So in the dimension one case, we prove that if we have one dimension, the very local ring with prime characteristic D, and we have two prime D ideals I and J, then firstly, the Hilbert Kuhn's multiplicity of the ideal j comma i t in the Riesz algebra of i is equal to the Hilbert Samuel multiplicity of the ideal j. So there are two interesting things to observe here. The first one, we are relating the Hilbert Kuhn's multiplicity of an ideal to the Hilbert Samuel multiplicity of the ideal j. This means in this case, the Hilbert Kuhn's multiplicity is actually an integer. Secondly, since it's equal to just the multiplicity of j, this means it's independent of whatever i we begin with. Uh, next, we actually go on in uh, finding out the Hilbert Kuhn's function of the ideal, and we prove the following. So let R be the reduction number of i, rho denote the postulation number of i. Then for all, for all large e, we prove that if the reduction number is bounded below by postulation number plus one, then we have the following expression of the Hilbert Kuhn's function of the ideal i comma i t in the Riesz algebra of i. Over here, as expected. Uh, from the first part of the result, the leading coefficient is multiplicity of i. There is no linear term in Q, but in uh, the constant part of the function, uh, as we observe, this function alpha sub i of i to the n comma e appears, which also appeared in the result of Monsky. And uh, this function is a periodic function in Q. Next, look at the case when r is bounded above by postulation number plus one. In this case also, we have an expression of the Hilbert Kuhn's function of the ideal i comma i t in the Riesz algebra of i. The leading coefficient is multiplicity of i. There is no linear term again, but again, uh, in the constant part, we see this eventually periodic function alpha sub i. This means, in this particular case, uh, the Hilbert Kuhn's function of the ideal i comma i t in the Riesz algebra of i is not a polynomial function, but rather it has a quasi polynomial nature. So what if the ring R is cohn -Mugal? So we have a one-dimensional cohn local ring in prime characteristic D. Now we take I to be a parameter ideal, J to be an M prime D ideal. And in this case, we prove that for all large E, when we look at the Hilbert Kuhn's function of the ideal J comma I T in the Riesz algebra of I, it has the following form. It is equal to Q square times multiplicity of J plus Q times alpha sub J of E. So again, the leading term here is multiplicity of J, which is expected. Now, in this case, the linear part has uh, this eventually periodic function alpha sub j, and there is no constant term. So, uh, this kind of says uh, the mysterious nature of uh, this function. Over here, we have linear uh, linearity uh, part coming up of the function, and it's actually this part which has the eventually periodic nature, and there is no constant term, which is totally opposite in the non coordinate case. So, let's quickly look at an example. So if you have a ring R, which is quotient of power series ring Pxy by an element x to the 5 minus y to the 5, k is a field of prime characteristic T, which is equivalent to plus minus 2 mod 5. Let m be the maximal ideal of the ring, and uh, q is p to the e for sum. In this case, Monsky proved that for all large e, when we look at length of R over n square bracket q, which is the Hilbert Kuhn's function of e of R with respect to its maximal homogeneous ideal, it is 5q plus alpha sub n of e, where this eventually periodic function is equal to minus 4 if e is even, or it is equal to minus 6 if e is odd. 
to using this result of months key and the results I just put up, let's calculate something. We calculate the Hilbert Kuhn's function of the idle m comma mp in the Riesz algebra of the maximum value. And by substituting everything, we prove that this is equal to 5p squared plus 0 if it is even and minus 10 if it is odd. And since this ring is Kuhn Macaulay, we can also look at the idle m comma mp in the Riesz algebra of i. And in this case, we prove that uh, the Hilbert Kuhn's, multi uh, Hilbert Kuhn's function is 5q squared plus minus 4q if e is even and minus 6q if e is odd. So, um, of course, this mysterious nature of uh, the function is worth exploring. And things can go really weird in terms of uh, the quasi polynomial nature as well. One has to keep this in mind and uh, explore further and further. Next, we look at uh, the case in higher dimensions. So in higher dimensions, we prove something more. We look at what is called as the generalized Hilbert Kuhn's function. This term was coined by Conta in 1996. So let's quickly define what it is. So let R be a node in ring of arbitrary characteristic. Either it is local or it is a standard graded key algebra where k is a field. We fix a system of generators of the maximal idle, say x1 up till xp. Then uh, if x to the square bracket s, we denote this by the idle generated by the s power of the elements, then the generalized Hilbert Kuhn's function of r with respect to this particular set of generators is defined as length of r over x to the square bracket s. The generalized Hilbert Kuhn's multiplicity in this case is the asymptotic limit of this function, provided that this limit exists. Uh, so Conta remarked a few things over here, first of all, the generalized Hilbert Kuhn's multiplicity may not always exist. And secondly, if the characteristic of the ring is positive and q is the prime power, then the generalized Hilbert Kuhn's function as well as multiplicity coincides with the usual Hilbert Kuhn's function and multiplicity. Moreover, it is also independent of the choice of the generating set of the idea. So um, as I mentioned, Conta had remarked that the generalized Hilbert Kuhn's multiplicity may not exist. This means the asymptotic limit of this function may not exist. Since over here, we are looking at not just the prime bracket powers, but also all natural bracket powers of the idle, in order to say that the asymptotic limit does not exist, uh, means that possibly there are two subsequences of bracket powers of natural numbers, which uh, converge to two different limits. So an example illustrating the same was given by Bookwrights and Chen in 1997. And they considered the following thing. So let R be quotient of polynomial ring Px by Z by an element x plus y plus z. K is a field of uh, characteristic P strictly bigger than 2, and n is the maximum homogeneous set. So let's look at the first subsequence uh, of the uh, bracket powers of the natural numbers. So let q is equal to p to the e. In this case, we want to calculate length of r over n square bracket q. So uh, since q is a prime power, uh, k has prime characteristic. This means we want to look at length of kxy over xq plus yq and xq comma yq and x plus y whole to the q. Uh, since they are in characteristic p, this is same as calculating length of kxy over xq comma yq. And since x comma yq forms a regular sequence, it's exactly equal to q square. Now, now let's look at a uh, different subset. Q is equal to 2 times p to the e. In this case, uh, one can compute that length of r over m square bracket q is equal to 3 by 4 times q square. Uh, this requires some minor calculations if you're interested in knowing the details. Uh, they are there in the paper, uh, but can one can always sit down and work it out. Uh, it's just like in the interest of space and time, the things are not here, but what is important to note that uh, we have two different subsequences which are converging to two different limits, hence proving that the generalized Hilbert Kuhn's multiplicity may not always exist. But there are some cases known in which uh, the, Hilbert, the generalized Hilbert Kuhn's multiplicity exists. Uh, they were given by Conta in the same paper where he proved uh, that if we have a quotient of a polynomial ring uh, by an ideal i, which is generated by either monomials or a principal binomial homogeneous idle, then in these two cases, the generalized Hilbert Kuhn's multiplicity indeed exists. So we thought possibly can we do something in the case of Riesz algebra in higher dimensions for generalized Hilbert functions, function. And this is the following setup. 
So we consider a d-dimensional Kuhn-Mukali local ring, a parameter ideal i, and we fix a set of generators of i. With this, we define two functions. The first one is f s comma m. This is length of i square bracket s over i square bracket s times i to the n. So this is more like the Hilbert Samuel function of the module i square bracket s with respect to the ideal i if we fix the larger number. The next one is the Hilbert Samuel function, f sub i of n. This is length of r over i to the n, and s and n are natural numbers. So, this was uh, what, what was interesting in proving the main result was uh, this function, f s comma n. Uh, this came up in one of the calculations which were important to decipher in order to proceed. And it's actually this uh, nature of this function which plays an important role in the main theory. And this is what we proved that uh, if the dimension of the ring is at least 2 and if we fix the natural number s then the function f has the following expression proving that firstly it's a piecewise continuous polynomial and secondly uh, it's also independent of the choice of the generator set of the ideal i why because in the expression of this function it's only dependent on the dimension of the ring and on the hilbert samuel function of the ideal which we know is independent of the choice of the generator set with this, we prove the main result. So let R be a cohn mukali local ring of dimension at least 2. We have a parameter ideal i in the ring R and we have this natural number s which is bigger than or equal to the dimension of the ring. In this case, we prove that the generalized Hilbert Kuhn's function of the ideal i comma i2 in the case algebra of i has the following form. So firstly, it proves that uh, the function in this case is a piecewise polynomial. Uh, why do I say this? Because uh, the expression over here only says it for s bigger than equal to d, but we also have a precise expression when s is strictly less than d, but uh, uh, in the interest of space and time, I thought it's bit best to put this, uh, but of course, it's a piece, we prove that it's a piecewise polynomial function. Moreover, it's only dependent on the dimension of the ring and the Hilbert Samuel multiplicity of the ideal, and hence proving that it's kind of independent of the choice of generating set of the ideal i. So we have an exact expression of the generalized Hilbert Kuhn's function. So what about the leading term? Uh, in this expression, the generalized Hilbert Kuhn's multiplicity, which is the leading term of the above polynomial, is CD times multiplicity of i, where CD is again uh, the rational number which has appeared before in the result of Ito and Ishida as well as in the result of uh, Miller and Swanson and it will again uh, keep coming up. So this is an important rational number. Now, it's, a, it's an important rational number in this case and it does play an important role when we are computing the Hilbert Kuhn's multiplicity of various ideals in these cases. So this completes the story uh, of this project. But then we want to look at certain classes of rings and do some computation. And uh, we picked up Stanley Redmond rings. Uh, so let me quickly recall what uh, the setup of these rings is. So let delta be a d minus one dimensional simplicial complex on vertex set one, two, up to r. So corresponding to this simplicial complex, we form a polynomial ring. So since we have r vertices, we consider a polynomial ring with r variables x1 up till xr over a field k. Now we have a face set of delta. This means uh, f is a face of maximal dimension. Corresponding to this face, we form an ideal, a prime ideal in the ring S. We call it P sub f, and it is the ideal generated by the variables x sub i, where the vertex i is not part of the face set f. Now let's say if we have a collection of face sets f1 up to f alpha of the simplicial complex. Corresponding to these facets, we have prime ideals pf1 up to pf alpha. We intersect these ideals and call this intersected ideal as i sub delta. This ideal i delta i sub delta is called the Stanley Reisner ideal corresponding to the simplicial complex. And the Stanley Reisner ring of delta, which we denote by k delta, is the quotient ring s mod i delta. Since the simplicial complex is d minus one dimension. The dimension of the Stanley Reisner ring is equal to d. Next, we define the f vector of delta. So, f vector of delta is actually a tuple 
where the first entry f sub minus 1 is equal to 1 and the other f i's f sub i's these are the number of i dimensional pieces of delta this means by f sub 0 we mean the number of zero dimensional pieces of delta in particular these are number of vertices similarly f, f sub 1 is equal to number of edges and so on up till f d minus 1 where f sub d minus 1 is equal to number of facets basically cases of maximum dimension. Next, I'll quickly recall a result of Stanley where he proved that when we calculate Hilbert series of this ring K delta, it's a rational function. Moreover, it is written in the following form. It's a polynomial mod, it's a polynomial mod 1 minus 3 to the D. And when we look at the coefficients of this polynomial and collect them in a tuple, uh, which is h0, h1 up till hd, we call this as the h vector of the simplicial complex delta. So over here, if one carefully observes, the Stanley Reisner ring is basically a quotient of a polynomial, it's, it's, it's a quotient of a polynomial ring by an ideal i, which is a monomial ideal and is reduced. And of course, there are many other classes of examples which also fit in a similar setup. So we work in a more general setup and uh, uh, Later, we'll specialize to the case of standardizing. So the setup is as follows. So we have a polynomial ring S, which is the polynomial ring over a field K in variables X1 up till XR. N is the maximum homogeneous ideal of this ring S. Then we have these ideals P1 up till P alpha, alpha becoming equal to 2. These are distinct ideals which are generated by subsets of the variables X1 up till XR. So these ideals actually correspond to uh, the ideals P sub F1 up till F alpha, which were coming from the facets of the simplicial complex. Next, we look at the ideal I, which is the intersection of all these ideals, and we take the ring R to be the portion S mod I. Uh, the, we suppose that the ring has dimension D, and eta, which is M mod I, is the maximal homogeneous ideal of the ring. I'll quickly recall this result which computes the length of R over J to the S for any eta primary ideal uh, J in the ring R. So this is a result from Brunson Herzog or um, rather any book you can uh, consider. So uh, this is one standard result which says that in the set of what is length of R over J to the S. So let, uh, let's say we have the Hilbert series of the associated graded ring of J. So the associated graded ring of J is actually an n graded ring whose nth component is J to the n over J to the n plus 1. So let's say the Hilbert series of the associated graded ring is of the form a polynomial HT over 1 minus T whole to the D. And let's say H to the round bracket I denotes the I derivative of the function or rather the polynomial H with respect to T. Then for all natural number S, we have an exact expression of length of r over j to the s. This is an alternating sum of the derivatives of the polynomial h at 1 over i factorial times this function. In particular, if j is equal to eta, we have an expression of length of r over eta to the s, and this is true for all s in the set of natural numbers. So now let's come back to the main point. We want to compute the generalized Hilbert Kunz function of the ideal eta comma eta t in the Reese algebra of the ideal eta. So uh, the approach we took to compute this length is the following. We know that this quotient is of finite length. This means when we look at the graded components, there are only finitely many non-zero graded components. Thus, in order to calculate the length of this quotient, it is enough to ca uh, calculate the length of the, each of these graded components and add them up. And if one looks at the graded components of this quotient, they exactly look like this. Uh, if you're intrigued by how this com comes up, just look at the uh, graded decomposition of the ideal eta comma eta d square bracket s. Uh, look at the graded components and everything will fall into place. The only uh, thing over here is the stopping criteria star. So star means that beyond this particular stage, all the graded components are zero. So this means we need to calculate the lengths of each of these quotients. So let's rearrange a bit. So over here, I'm just splitting, uh, splitting length of uh, eta to the n over eta bracket s eta to the n as length of r over eta bracket s eta to the n. 
minus length of r over eta to the n. Now this length is something we know from the previous slide. Uh, it's a well-known term for all natural numbers n. And now this kind of length is something that we need to decipher in order to proceed further. Now uh, what we have is the following. We have a ring R, which is quotient of polynomial ring, and we have its maximal homogeneous ideal I. And if one recalls back, the function f may, may help us uh, to figure out what this length looks like. So in my project with the Arinda Manaji and Professor Varma, we actually observed this thing and proved the following result, to calculate the length of this quotient R over eta bracket S times eta to the N. We proved that for all S and uh, N natural numbers, this length has the following form, which is an alternative sum of lengths. And these lengths are now easy to compute once we know the function F. Why? Over here, S is the polynomial ring. PI is the I generated by the subsets of the indeterminates. This means the quotient S mod PI is again a polynomial ring. And the image of m in this quotient will be a maximum homogeneous ID. And hence a parameter ID. And this properly fits in, in the setup of the function f. And since the function f was a piecewise polynomial function, uh, this means all these uh, length functions are also piecewise polynomial. This means our main function, length of r over eta bracket s times eta to the n, is a polynomial function. It's a piecewise polynomial function in s comma n. So uh, what we really do here is uh, really an algorithmic approach. Uh, we, have an, we have an expression of things where individually we can compute all these lengths uh, given a particular example. And then we can keep on substituting things and the final answer will come into place. Uh, of course, I'll uh, look at a few examples to illustrate uh, that things do happen, but then we have to first say uh, that this function is indeed a polynomial function. And then we also have to look at the stopping criteria. The stopping criteria start to begin with. And we also have to say beyond what value uh, do we expect this function to behave as a polynomial function. And in that line, we prove the following. So let's say we have a finitely generated R module M. And uh, in this case, we define a rather set up A sub I of M to be the maximum non-zero period component of the ith local cohomology module of M with respect to the maximum homogeneous ID, provided that this module is non-zero. Otherwise, we set A sub i of N to minus infinity. Then we set delta to be the maximum of the absolute values of A sub i of R, provided that these numbers are not equal to minus infinity. And in this case, we prove that for S strictly bigger than delta, length of uh, the rather the generalized uh, Hilbert Kunz function of the ideal eta comma eta t in the least algebra of eta is a polynomial in this. So uh, let's quickly look at a few examples uh, to see that this method actually works. So one quick example is the following simplicial complex. So we have this edge x1 comma x2 joined to a two simplex x2 x3 x4. In this case, the standard is a ring corresponding to the simplicial complex is uh, k x1 x2 x3 x4 by the ideal x1 intersection x3 comma x4. It's a dimension 3 ring and uh, the f vector of this ring is given by 1 comma 4 comma 1. This means there's only one tessit. And if one substitutes everything in the main result, we prove that for s strictly bigger than 3, the generalized Hilbert Kunz function of the ideal eta comma eta t in the least algebra of eta has the following form. Since the ring is dimension 3, this polynomial is of degree d plus 1, so it's a polynomial of degree 4. The leading coefficient is cd times uh, fd minus 1, which actually comes by the result of eta and Ishida, because uh, these are the classes of rings in which uh, the equality condition posed by them is satisfied. So fd minus 1 is 1 here, and cd in case of dimension 3 is 13 over 8. So this indeed uh, is in line with what is known. So we have an expression for uh, the Hilbert, general Hilbert Kunz function in this case. And uh, as I mentioned, there are various other classes of examples, not just standardized rings, which fit up in this setup. 
uh, one popular, the other popular class of examples is the examples of uh, graphs where we can look at such rings, rings uh, meaning the quotient of polynomial rings by an ideal i which is reduced and generated by monomials. So in this setup, we look at graphs with finite number of vertices and this ideal i is now the edge ideal which corresponds to the edges of the graph. As a particular example, we'll be looking at the complete pipetite graph. So what are such kind of graphs? This means we look at the graphs in which the vertex set can be partitioned, partitioned in a way that uh, every two vertices in the same partition uh, don't share an edge. And also uh, any two vertices in opposite, uh, in two different uh, sets, they should always be joined with an edge. So in this particular case, we are looking at a partition in which one partition has three elements, the other has four. No two elements in the same set have, are adjoined by an edge, but every two elements from different sets have an edge. So this is something we denote by K3 comma 4. Over here, this uh, ring R is quotient of S mod I, where S is a polynomial ring in seven variables, X1 up till X3 and Y1 up till Y4. I is the edge ideal, this means corresponding to every edge, we have a monomial in the ideal I. So given this edge x1, y1, x1, y2, x1, y3, and x1, y4, we have the monomials x1, y2, x1, y3, x1, y4 in the ideal I, and so on for every edge, we have a monomial in the ideal I. R is this quotient, S mod I. It's a four-dimensional ring, and the f vector over here is 17971. This means the maximal faces, the number of maximal dimensional faces is only one. And again, if we substitute everything in the algorithm, then we prove that for s strictly bigger than 4, the generalized Hilbert Prince function of the ID eta comma eta t, the Gilles algebra of eta, has the following form. Since the dimension of ring is 4, the polynomial is of degree 5. The reading coefficient is CD times FT minus 1. FT minus 1 is equal to 1, and CD in this case is 61 root 30. Again, this falls in line with Morris and Lenny. So uh, one can still uh, put things in the algorithm as long as we do not have many faces, many facets, the maximal dimensional faces. But what if uh, there are many maximal dimensional faces? And in that case, possibly, it might not be easier to compute by hand, given the algorithm. And there are examples in which uh, there are, you know, huge number of uh, facets. Uh, so in order to tackle this situation, what we did in the paper was the following. Uh, we put this algorithm in the quality two as a function. And uh, if one passes, we standardize the ideal. And the point at which the function needs to be computed in the algorithm or in the Nakalitu function, then the function outputs the value of the uh, of the polynomial at that point. And then one can always interpolate and uh, get the final polynomial in front of us. So uh, that algorithm indeed helps if we have uh, a lot many uh, facets. So one such example in which uh, there are huge number of facets is the triangulation of real projective theory. So if R is the corresponding standard as the ring, the F vector of uh, F vector in this case is actually 1, 6, 15, and 10. This means we are dealing with 10 maximal dimensional faces. And uh, believe me, it's not very easy to do it by hand, but once you plug everything uh, in the Macaulay function at various points, it gives you the answer and then one can interpolate and get the final form. And this is what the result we get. For S bigger than or equal to 1, this is the expression of the generalized Hilbert Prince function of the ideal eta comma eta t in the Riesel algebra of eta. So uh, this is, uh, we were able to uh, find or rather prove uh, that the Hilbert Prince multiplicity and function have mysterious nature in certain classes of ideal centerings, but uh, there are a lot more cases in which uh, the situation can be further explored. And of course, there are a lot more questions, even in the current scenario that one can ask. For example, uh, we did say that we have this polynomial expression for uh, the Hilbert Prince function. Uh, we know what the leading coefficient is using the result of Ephraim Yashida, 
but then uh, the nature of other coefficient is still mysterious to us uh, in this case. Uh, moreover, uh, one can also ask if uh, these coefficients have any combinatorial interpretations uh, or any algebraic interpretations connecting with the ring or with the graph or with the sensation complex. So uh, there are a lot many unanswered questions that even we are exploring and we also encourage the participants to uh, look into them and uh, explore further. So uh, yeah, with this, I'll finish my talk. These are some of the references which I've used in my talk. Yeah, thank you for the attention.